All right, so let's talk about primitive types in a generic programming language. So this goes back to what I'm actually going to be talking about here is primitive types in the C programming language, this guy right here. Um, and we'll see how that changes. But all these languages I'm claiming come from C. So understanding the original primitive types and then seeing where we've made a couple of deviations, I think, is uh, uh, valuable. And this is related to memory and variables uh, in our programming languages. Again, how human beings solve problems, memory, asking questions, and repetition, and every one of our programming languages having facilities for those three things. So, primitive types. We have byte, short, int, long, char, float, double, and boolean. So let's start with this. A byte holds a whole 8-bit number. A short holds a whole well, actually, I'm going to do it this way. Whole integer number. Whole integer number. Just start with that. So in the C programming language, we have a byte, a short, an int, and a long all capable of holding whole integer numbers. So for instance, we can hold the number 17 as a byte, as a short, as an int, and as a long. Question is, is why do we need so many different ways of remembering whole numbers? How many of you heard of the Y2K bug? Okay. What is the Y2K bug? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the idea here is, is that um, 1999 to 2000, they thought computers would crash because prior to that the year field in dates was stored as two digits rather than four meaning that 1900 and 2000 would both be zero zero Make sense? So the question is, is then, why did they store years as two digits instead of four? And so that's it, they just didn't think? Couldn't be more than that? If you were a programmer back in, you know, so a lot of our user applications uh, were probably written in the, uh, at this time, uh, the things they were really worried about, like power grid, stuff driving the power grid and things like that. These were probably things from the late 70s, mid eight to the mid, mid 80s, something like that. Um, so relatively old software uh, at that point in time. If you wrote that software, um, so let's just use 1975 as our example. Uh, so you're writing software in 1975. Um, why might you decide to store the year as two digits instead of four? What's the difference? Why you, what does it cost us to store it as four digits instead of two digits? What's the trade-off? What are we saving by doing it in two digits? Space, what kind of space? 
Memory. How much memory do we have in our computers back then? We had even less free space than he has. <laughs> right? So we had computers with 16 kilobytes of memory, 8 kilobytes of memory. Not a lot of memory. Not enough to go throwing around, you know, some giant four digit number when we could have done it in two. Does that make sense? We had to be careful as programmers back then. We don't really have to be as careful today because we just have plenty of memory. Memory used to be expensive. So, um, today, if you have a computer that has, um, so you go out and get a laptop, and it has uh, 8 gigabytes of RAM in it, and you want to upgrade it to 16 gigs, you want to double the RAM, so 8 gigabytes of memory. How much would it cost you to get an 8 gigabyte memory stick today? Ish. Probably a little more than 20, but not by a lot, right? So, 8 gigabytes of memory today is like, let's just call it 40 bucks, okay? It's possible you could probably order it from some crazy website, maybe get it cheaper, okay? The example will still work well here, don't worry. 40 bucks is, is fine. So, you're saying 40 bucks, we're paying top dollar. This is Amazon retail prices for our eight gigabytes of RAM. All right. So back in 1996, I had a computer um, that had eight megabytes of memory in it. And I wanted to double the memory to uh, 16 megabytes. Now, just real quickly, just so we can do the math here. Go ahead and do the conversion for me. How much is, assuming the eight gigabyte chip is 40 bucks, how much is that per megabyte? So do the math, take a, take a minute to do the math based on what we've talked about today, to convert um, eight gigabytes into megabytes and tell me how much, how many cents per megabyte it costs. That way we're dealing with the right numbers. So how do I turn eight gigabytes into megabytes? Multiply it by, I'm already in the eight column. They're both bytes. We have eight gigabytes. I'm trying to get to megabytes. So we multiply it by 1,024, right? So it's eight times 1,024, so that's 8,192. So this is 8,192 megabytes. All right, and we're gonna take $40 divided by that. So 40 divided by 8,192 is 4.8 cents. Actually, that's not even right, is it? Even less than that, it's 0.4 cents. Yeah. So 0.4 cents per megabyte. So we need to buy at least two megabytes and donate the rest of the penny to charity <laughs> in order to get uh, two megabytes of uh, memory. All right, so 0.4 cents per megabyte if we were getting memory today. So back in 1996, when I wanted to get my eight megabytes of memory chip, how much do you think eight megabytes of memory cost me in 1996? Huh? Hundreds? thousand dollars one thousand dollars in 
Now here's the kicker. That's in 1996. Remember, we're talking 1975 by our example here, right? This is after memory had already started coming down in price. All right, so now we have 1,000 divided by eight, so that's $125. per megabyte. And we haven't even taken inflation into consideration here. It's actually worse. Because you have to decide what is the $1,000 today in 19, what is the $1,000 in 1995 money today? So, $1,995 1996 money today. There's usually a little converter thing. 1,637.82. Okay, so this is actually that in today's dollars. So I divide that by eight. So it's actually $204 per megabyte in today's dollars. And again, this is after memory had already come down in price. This was cheap. So do you see how our mentality now has flipped? Memory is cheap today. Now, does that mean we never have to worry about memory consumption? When would be examples that we, when we need to worry about memory consumption in today's computers? As a programmer, let's say. Maybe really large scientific-y type of simulations and stuff where we're working with huge amounts of data at that point, we might start filling up our tons and tons and tons of memory. But at this point where our mindset is probably moving towards this idea of general purpose computers, right? Like these laptops that are sitting in front of us. But are all the computers that we deal with on a daily basis general purpose computers? Or does our dishwasher have a little computer inside of it? And our TV sets have a little computer inside them. And some of our smart toasters have little computers inside them. So we have these little embedded systems today. And the embedded systems today um, are a lot more like the general purpose computers from the 70s, right? In terms of the amount of memory that's in them and the processing power that's in them. Because they're solving much simpler problems by our today's standards, right? And they cost a lot less, you know, you, know, you don't need to have a massive laptop inside of your dishwasher. It needs to be able to manage your five or six different dishwashing cycles and do that well and do that fast and not add the price to the price of the dishwasher by a substantial amount, right? So on systems like that, we are still dealing with a relatively small amount of memory, a relatively you know, low powered processor. Whereas programmers, we do need to focus on memory footprint and some of these other things. It becomes important, okay? And actually it translates into dollars because if you are a, um, a, a dishwashing uh, manufacturer, Maytag or something like that, you're designing your next latest greatest dishwasher and you can buy your embedded system chips from company X uh, and you can get the 16 kilobit chips or you can get the 30 or the 16 kilobyte chips or you can get the 32 kilobyte chips for even if by at a glance human standards we say oh that's not that much more maybe it's 10 cents more or it's 20 cents more you might say oh it's worth it but now you have to figure out across thousands and thousands of dishwashers that they're going to produce around the world that starts adding up into measurable dollars 
all because some programmer didn't use a variable type that was the appropriate size for storing some value. Instead, they just said, well, we'll just kind of stretch out. We're in first class in the airline here. We'll put our feet up wherever we want. You know, we'll store the number three inside of a, a place capable of holding 64 bits. Who cares? Even though we only need two bits to store the number three. So we've wasted 62 bits. That's a lot of elbow room, right? Especially if you just cost the company you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars because they had to spend a little bit more on those embedded processors, those embedded chips, because you couldn't be an efficient programmer. This problem hasn't gone away, it's just shifted. Does that make sense? All right, so it's still something that as programmers, we should focus on, we should think about. Now that doesn't, but we should still be using the right tool for the job. So it doesn't mean that we need to be that careful commonly but we need to understand this issue so that when we are faced with a problem where we need to consider this stuff, we can. Does that make sense? All right, so it is important. Um, memory used to be a lot more expensive than this. Thousand bucks for eight megabytes, that was cheap. You can't even fathom it today, right? All right, so we go back a byte was a 8-bit integer value. A short is a 16-bit integer value. An int is a 32-bit integer value. A long is a 64-bit integer value. All right, now all of these guys we're going to presume are what are called signed values. That means they can hold positive and negative numbers. Falk, I'll go ahead and put signed in front of these. So, the range of values that could fit in a byte is negative 128 to positive 127. All right, in one of my other classes, we talk about something called two's complement and how we actually encode those values to get the extra value on the negative side. So, negative 128 to positive 127, there's 256 unique values that could be represented by an 8 bit number. which is two to the eighth power. 256 unique values, all right? Short, this is negative 32,768 to positive 32,767. There's 65,536 unique values in a 16-bit number or Two to the sixteenth, sixty-five thousand five hundred and thirty-six. Make sense? An int is negative four point one billion to positive four point one billion. So it's two to the thirty-second, which is going to be eight some billion. Oh, I'm sorry. Negative 2.1 to positive 2.1. So that's 4.29 billion. 4,294,000 or 4,294,967,296 unique um, uh, values in the integer bit space, or two to the 32 unique values. I start losing my precision here. This is something like uh, uh, negative 16 quintillion, something like that. So this is two to the 64th power 
uh, divided by two, yeah, 9.2 quintillion. So negative 9.2 quintillion to 9.2 quintillion. Big numbers. So negative two to the 64 divided by two to positive two to the 64 divided by two. Ish, just one extra one on the negative side. All right, so relatively small numbers, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a lot bigger, whatever. All right, so if we need to store a number that is between negative 128 and positive 127, it would be in our best interest for efficiency to store that inside of a byte if we're trying to be careful about memory usage. All right. Now, so questions about that. Realistically in modern programming, especially if we're dealing with a compiled language and a, a, a strongly typed language where we do need to define the type, Python we don't. Python we just, an int is an int. We give it its value and it works with what we give it uh, because it's based on top of an interpreter which then just works with the numbers locally. You would not use an interpreted loosely typed language like Python if you needed a lot of control over memory usage. Python gives you convenience without putting in a lot of effort of creating something brand new at the cost of the uh, um, losing some of that control over the, the details. So, um, in a modern compiled language, we probably would use an int most of the time. And if that wasn't big enough, we would use a long. If that wasn't big enough, we'd go over to some kind of object type that allows us to deal with arbitrary size values that just get slower as we move to uh, those values. You would still sometimes use bytes, especially if you were working with uh, streaming video or something like that, where things tend to come in in bite-sized chunks. Uh, modern computing, you would rarely ever see a short. They still exist. Java supports shorts, Swift supports shorts. Uh, but you would very rarely in a modern computer program see a short. You would commonly see bytes in any sort of network type programming. Um, ints are going to be very, very, very common and longs every now and then. Deal with char. A char is a unsigned, now we're going to have to deal with a little bit of evolution here. So this is an unsigned 8-bit integer value. Why is that, so when you see here char, char sounds like it's a variable type capable of holding what? Character. Character. Why is it holding an integer? Why are chars stored as ints? What's a character set? Can you give me an example of any character set you've heard of? You said alphabet? Okay, technically the alphabet is a character set. That's the English character set. But computer character sets. Character sets that we use inside of our computers. We have something called ASCII. We have something called Unicode. At least seen those. So ASCII is a seven bit character mapping from numbers to chars. So we actually store numbers and then we look up those numbers on the ASCII chart to find out number 63 is actually this character. Okay, and we have seven bits of these, which means that there's 127 characters in the ASCII character set. There's not a great, this is, uh, um, I'm not sure how political this was in the end, but uh, ASCII stands for the American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Okay, you could probably translate into this into something like uh, Americans use English, so everybody else should too. 
um, something along those lines. Because they said, well, you know, we only have, we have, what, 26 characters in our alphabet. You need your upper and lowercase characters. And you, got to have, you have to have your 0 through 9, because we, you know, we use base 10. Uh, and you need your punctuation, commas, and things like that. You know, then, rather than try to bring in some other popular languages and stuff like that, you know, we, well, we have some, like, weird symbols, like, for, like, the square root, things like that. That's in the ASCII character set. We have, like, some playing cards. We have smiley faces. And then we, we ran out of stuff. We said, okay, well, we only got 128 of these. Man, yeah. I, I still have another bit. I could have eight bits if I wanted to and just have another 128. Maybe we pick another language. And now nah, we'll just stop at seven bits. It's fine. <laughs> the, rest, the rest of the world can just deal. <laughs> right? So, uh, yeah, so ASCII, you know, uh, this is part of the C primitive type was a, so a char in C is an unsigned eighth bit integer because it's based in bytes. We didn't have a way of representing it as seven bits, but the actual ASCII character set is only a seven bit character set. Um, Unicode is a 16 bit character mapping from numbers to chars. All right, so that's what Unicode is. 16 bits, still gonna store numbers that get looked up on the Unicode uh, chart and then translate it into the character. You know, the first 127 of those are ASCII. So Unicode is a superset of the ASCII character set. So the first 127 of Unicode is the 127 characters of the ASCII character set. Uh, 128 characters of the ASCII character set, um, 0 to 127. Um, after that, we have brought in some other languages that other human beings might use. Not that they do use. Everybody has finally given in and says, okay, the dumb Americans are going to use English, so we're just going to learn it. Right? <laughs> Hence, we have all sorts of different languages represented in this world, yet you're listening to me babble in English. It's the way it works, I suppose. I didn't make the rules. <laughs> I'm just thank, I'm thanking God that's what they are because I only know English and bad English. Actually, I don't even know good English. I know bad English and enough Spanish to order at Taco Bell. I think I told you last time. Um, yeah, so that's the punchline. At least Unicode is mostly inclusive. It's not all the world's languages, but it's a lot of them, right? We're, we're fairly inclusive with Unicode. Uh, and most of our modern programming languages uh, are based in Unicode, not in ASCII. But if we roll back to C++, well, C and C++, these were during the time where, well, we probably still don't care. But during a time when we definitely didn't care, <laughs> let's just say. All right, but punchline here is, is that is why um, chars are represented as inter integer values. So in C, it would be an 8-bit integer value. In, in Java, C sharp, it would be 16 bits. Python, I'm sure it's 16 bits. It's a Unicode. I mean, it's going to be up to the interpreter how they want to handle it. But any of our modern languages, a character type will be a 16-bit unsigned integer. Why unsigned? Unsigned means does not support negative values. So if my character set for ASCII is 0 to 127, and my character set for Unicode is 0 to 65,535, I don't need numbers less than 0, hence unsigned. I'd rather get 0 to 65,535 in a 16-bit value as opposed to negative 32,768 to positive 32,767 in a 16-bit value. Notice here our sign 16-bit value here doesn't get us up to 65,535 because it gives us space on the negative side. But if I go with an unsigned version of a 16-bit value, it would give us 0, 2, and then it would give us all of the space for magnitude, so 65,535 for a total of 65,536 unique values. Right, everybody has all those numbers memorized? <laughs> all 
I'm really questioning whether I should be drinking this water. It looked very cloudy when I put it into that cup. Minerals. The water fountain down the hall. Well, our water cooler was empty. And the cafeteria is closed. So I couldn't get my soda or my coffee. Well, they should do a lot of things, but we got to decide where the money goes. We got all this new furniture. We're already killing students off, so, you know, we're <laughs> mission accomplished. <laughs> we're doing all right. We got a bunch of new stuff. Can't really complain about a water fountain. Or a bubbler, right? Wisconsin, we call them bubblers. Yes, yeah, so I moved here from Illinois uh, 16 years ago. I, I had to go through the conversion. You know, so in Illinois, we call it water fountains. Here, it's called a bubbler. Illinois, we call it pop. Here, they call it soda. Yeah. The craziest thing, though, when I originally did my tour here in 2006, I had one of my, it was, she actually was my student the next semester. She was showing me around campus, and she introduced me to the time machine. Do you know what a time machine is? Take your money everywhere. It's an ATM machine. Well, so I previously had taught at Western Illinois University, so I was at a secular school. Now I'm coming to this Christian university, and they're showing me the time machine. <laughs> how, how deep does this rabbit hole go? So it was T-Y-M-E, take your money everywhere. It was, a, I guess, one of the companies that made ATM machines. Um, or it was maybe the original name for it, but then we started calling it ATM everywhere else. I've, I've always called it an ATM machine, but it, time machine was a thing here, and it made me, it unsettled me. <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, okay, so that's why chars are unsigned. They only need to hold values greater than or equal to zero. All right, but notice here so far, all of our types are numeric types. And we're gonna keep going with that trend. A float is a 32-bit signed decimal point value. And a double is a, this is actually kind of a, a lie. Let me do it like this. 32 before and 16 after bit sign decimal point value. A double is a 64 before and 32 after bit signed decimal point value. So this is actually a float is 48 bits in most modern implementations and a, uh, a double is 96 bits. So you're getting, before the decimal point, 64 bits of value, so up to the 9.2 quintillion. And then after the decimal point, you're getting the, uh, up to the 2.1. Uh, actually, you'd be get the, it would be unsigned after that, so you get the full 4.2 billion after the decimal point. So like 3.14 would be a float, but more things fit in there. So it's not just an integer type. But in any case, these are still numeric types, and really the way they're represented is like two integers glued together. You have a 32-bit integer, and then you have a 16-bit integer. And there's presumed to be a dot between them when it translates it for uh, the screen. Finally, Booleans. Booleans in modern languages are trues and falses. Uh, interesting thing, we talked about Objective-C earlier. In Objective-C, they represent Booleans as yes or no. I always thought that was fascinating. Um, I don't know, it's, a, it's a reasonable enough way of doing it. Um, but yes or no, true or false, whatever. But in the early days, these were actually unsigned bytes. Really, that's how it was underlying stored, but it was just a bit, a zero or a one. Zero for true, one for false. Actually, it was zero for true, not zero for false. Anything other than zero was false. 
All right, so that's our primitive types. They've evolved some over the years in terms of how they're actually uh, uh, represented in terms of number of bits, whether it's 8 bits, 16 bits, or whatever. But under the hood, all of our languages today have this stuff in, uh, uh, in common. All right. Um, and decisions then get made as we're writing code that relates to how this stuff, you know, how, how our uh, data types work. So whenever we represent values in a, uh, in a programming language, right out of the gate, a programming language is going to give us a set of primitive types that, and if we give a little definition to primitive types, a variable type only capable of holding a value as opposed to object types which we will talk about which can potentially hold zero or more values and well which can let's just say which can hold zero or more values and potentially do more functions, etc. So primitive types only remember a value. That's it. Object types, they can hold values, but they also can do more than that. And we'll see these through examples. But that's what differentiates a very simple variable type that's built into every language and then more complex data types that are built into the language, like strings, for example. Most of our modern languages, we can create a string, and that string can tell us its, can tell us its length. It can tell us um, you know, uh, whether it's uppercase, whether it's lowercase. It can give us individual characters from within it. So it has all sorts of other abilities other than just remembering that the string is hello world, something like that. All right, that makes some sense? Okay. All right, so we're going to start uh, going through this a little bit. This is related to your uh, homework assignments that you're going to be uh, uh, doing for next week, which is going to get you into using uh, Python. So make sure for next week, you, uh, if you haven't already done so, you have Linux running in one form or another on your uh, computer, whether it's running as a virtual machine uh, or it's running as, uh, you know, uh, on a, a dual boot, whatever it is, whatever you want to um, do. Notice here in uh, Blackboard, I have up here on the left a uh, video for installing Raspbian as a, in VirtualBox on your machine. Um, and then uh, here's the image for that. Uh, if you go into the um, CSC, the, I have another group of students who are installing the same thing. Some people have troubleshooted in the CSC 200 Slack channel. Um, you can find some uh, troubleshooting if you have any issues getting it on your uh, machine. But between this video and um, whatever, you should be able to get it on your machine one way or another for free. Okay, doesn't cost you anything. Anybody already do this? No problem? Okay, with VirtualBox? Anybody else do it already? Any issues? You did have issues? Yeah. Okay, so a couple Google searches kind of got it figured out. All right, so, uh, but again, so if you have questions, if you have issues as you're trying to get that put together, post about it on Slack. Uh, maybe some of the folks that already got it working can tell you the virtual box little things. I run mine in parallels, so it's possible if you run into an issue, it's a virtual box specific issue that I didn't run into just because I used a different virtual machine, but virtual box is free and parallels isn't, but I mean, I didn't pay for it. The university bought it, so it's, you know, it's, if, I didn't have that. I would just use virtual boxes is what it came down. I don't know. Maybe I would. I like parallels quite a bit. I'd probably just pay for parallels. 
Um, so in any case, you're going to be uh, working with Python. So for next week, you're going to be, you know, writing your proverbial hello world program in Python. Just make sure that you have your Linux thing installed and you have your uh, uh, interpreter working and all that stuff. And then you're going to start working with some logic for something called FizzBuzz, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, and then you have your third, uh, your second project homework, which takes that logic-based thing to another level up. Okay, so I'm going to talk about our constraints here a little bit. Um, so I come in here. So what I would start doing is if you click over here on the left under course book, that's going to take you to this website here called Automate the Boring Stuff. And I am in... So you can read chapter zero. Uh, we've already talked about that, whatever. Um, so go into Python basics. So really for this first uh, uh, assignment, it's gonna be chapter one, chapter two, and I think you might have to do a little from chapter three. So you'll be working with these. I would encourage you to just read through them before you start the homework uh, to familiarize yourself with it. But if you wanna just start it and reference back, you know, you choose your poison. But I'm just going to kind of flip through this and kind of point out highlights that I think are uh, beneficial. So one of the things they talk about here is this thing called the interactive shell. Okay, so once you get Python installed in your machine or if you uh, have, you know, so I want you to do this in Linux. So once you have Raspbian installed and you're over here, uh, you can get to the Python uh, interactive shell by just going out to the terminal typing uh, Python 3 and that'll take you to the shell like this um, and then you can type in things like 2 plus 2 and then it'll do the math so at this point I'm not really writing a Python program as much as I am talking directly to the Python interpreter all right so I'm, I'm having a conversation with the the interpreter in real time now you can do it from the terminal like this which is fine or if you are using Raspbian you can go up to the little raspberry guy here, go to programming, and the one that I think I've been using, I think both of these technically work, but if you do the Thony Python IDE comes with Raspbian, click on that, it'll open it up in here. They also give you the shell down here. So you can sit there and interact with the shell in here, and then that allows you to write a program up top here if you want and save it and run it and stuff. So this makes life a little bit nicer. Uh, maybe just using this, this type of thing. Um, but, you know, they're having you go through the interactive shell. Don't worry about this thing they tell you to install this Moo editor and stuff because we're doing it all with Raspbian. So just ignore that. You already have the interactive shell if you've gotten Raspbian Linux installed. Um, same thing's true. So this is just the stock version of Ubuntu. I'm just interested in whether or not uh, Python is by default installed. So I'm pretty sure I have not installed it on here. Finish loading. up a little better this time.
I'll just let it restart. We'll test it in case anybody wants to run uh, Ubuntu. But in any case, uh, go through here. You know, they are talking to you about just starting with Python. So if you've never done any programming or anything like that, you know, you might want to pay extra close of attention uh, to this. Um, but we get to our first section here, which really is kind of the important section, where they're introducing us to the operators of the Python language. So when we want to do mathy things, these operators will come in handy. So then you can go and explore how these operators work. So for instance, if I want to do, you know, these are pretty self-explanatory, right? Plus, minus, times, divide. So these are your normal, hey, I like to do math stuff. All right, so. Yep, so if you do a uh, stock install of Ubuntu, you have Python 3 on there as well. So if you prefer to run Ubuntu, you can. I'll put that guy to sleep. I'll put the Raspi in here. All right, so for example, if I'm... There we go. All right, so I can say two star star three. That'll take two to the third power. Two times two times two. That is how I do something to a power, not that. What just happened? I just did two caret three, and I got a one. Why? This deals with bits and things like that that we were talking about. The caret in most modern languages is the exclusive bitwise or. So what I mean by that is, so I did what? I did two and three. Because what sucks about examples like that is you put something in and you don't get an error message. You get an answer and you don't know why. You don't know what that answer means. So two like that is saying um, bitwise XOR of two and three. So what, it, what I mean by bitwise is it takes the bit version of those. So this is uh, a two is one zero, a three is one one. And it handles these on a bit by bit basis and it does an exclusive or on them. So and says one and the other. So they both have to be ones in order for an and to be one. Or says one or the other or both. Okay, so for an or, you only, need a, you only need at least one of them to be a one. Exclusive or says exactly one of them can be one. It's one or the other, but not both. So in this case here, a zero, X or a one is a one. A one X or a one, if it was an or, that would be a one. But it's not an or, it's a X or. So it cannot be both, so that's a zero. That's the binary representation of the number one. Hence why we got a one. So if I do something like um, one, one, zero, one, and then um, zero, zero, one, zero. So this is what ones, twos, fours, eights. This is 12, 13, so this is the number 13. Uh, this guy is a number two. So this would be a one, 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 one. So this should give us a 15. So 13, 
What was the two? There's our 15. See how that guy's working? So super common mistake for uh, beginning programmers is to automatically assume that the way you take the power is to use the caret. And the downside to that is you won't get an error message, you'll get bad math. Make sense? All right, so if I actually want to do 13 to the two's power or two to the third power, I would do two star star three. That is two to the third power. 13 star star two. That is 13 squared. Make sense? All right, at some point I just saved you a bunch of debugging time. <laughs> All right, remember that. In fact, I would probably say that very, very, very rarely will modern programmers ever use the caret in programming. You'd have to be doing something like network programming or something with operating systems where you actually care about bitwise operations. There's bitwise ands, there's bitwise ors, there's bitwise zors. Um, there's also bit, uh, shift operators for um, shifting values. These are things that are not necessarily used on, let's call it business application development. Um, so, whatever, that's the, that's the scoop. All right, so star star gives us an exponent. Might be handy. This next guy, put a giant star next to this in your, uh, um, your notes, super important. The percent symbol is modulus, or the remainder uh, symbol. Third grade math, remember long division? We've been using it quite a bit today. Dividing something by some number, recording the quotient, and recording the uh, value, right? Recording the remainder, rather. So for instance, if I take 13 divided by five, Well, actually, good. let's go this route first. Let's say 13 mod 5. 5 goes into 13 two times with a remainder of 3. So I would expect this guy to give me the remainder. He's going to give me the 3. 13 divided by 5. Now, this is a, if you come to Python from a background of C, C++, Java, C Sharp, any of those compiled languages, you would expect this guy right here to give you a two, okay? But it won't. In Python, it does floating point division using a normal slash. If I did that in Java, it would give me a two. It truncates. If I want the version of that for Python, it's 13 divide divide. So two slashes says do integer division. That will give me the two. Okay, um, which is actually handy because if we were working in, let's say you were working in Java or C or C++ and you actually wanted to get the 2.6, you would have to say 13.0 divided by 5.0. You would have to force it to treat those two values as floating point values in order for it to do floating point division to give you the 2.6 where Python handles it at, the, op at the, the operator level. A single slash does floating point division, a double slash does integer division. And if you're doing integer division, two things are possible. You're either accepting the fact that you're gonna lose some precision, right? Or you're probably going to use it in conjunction with the modulus operator to get remainders. Make sense? All right. Um, so, we'll call these first four our, uh, um, well, first three and a half, let's call it, our special cases, because this slash and double slash are, you know, we need to be a little careful with those. Modulus, super powerful. Uh, a lot of people don't use um, them very often, but some of our most powerful uh, um, things are based on third grade math. Uh, that we find in uh, computer science. Modulus is used all over the place. Um, I actually find I rarely use exponents. There's almost always a uh, function that'll do, like a math function that'll do something to a power. So many languages don't even have an exponent operator. You just, like in Java, you do, you say math.pal, 
three comma two, and that takes three to the second power. Um, okay, so questions about any of those operators? Uh, all right, so then we also have the whole thing order of operation. So this is just like normal math, where um, multiplication and division are more powerful than addition and subtraction. Uh, power is even more powerful. So it's taking an exponent will happen first. Um, multiplication division happens left to right, but will always happen before addition and uh, subtraction. Now you can rely on knowing that or just use parentheses when you want to make it clear. That would be my recommendation. All right, so for instance, in this case here, we're not taking 2 plus 3 is 5 times 6 is 30. Instead, we're taking 3 times 6, which is 18, plus 2 is 20. Because order of operation says do multiplication first. Right? So if you're not super confident with your order of operation or you want to make your code easier to read by others, just put the parentheses where you want in the way that you want the math to happen, even if it's going to automatically happen that way. All right. All right, we see that string data types are surrounded by single quotes or double quotes. Either of them will work. So for instance, I can come out here to, um, and I can say, hello, or I can notice it actually converted it to single quote, hello, single quote. Okay, so they're, they're interchangeable, let's say. Um, I will almost always put double quotes around them because most of our compiled languages based off of uh, C use double quotes. Um, so you will often see me write it with, uh, with double quotes. All right. Um, string concatenation. The idea of concatenation is gluing strings together. So I can say, hello, or actually, let me just. How do I get it back up to the top? Aha. All right. So I can say something like, hello, concatenated with world, and that'll glue them together with no spaces, giving me hello world. Hello, concatenated with a space, concatenated with world will give you it with a space. Now, hello, concatenated with five. That guy gives me a problem. This plus operator here, we just saw a few minutes ago, that guy is for addition. But we just saw a second ago that if I use it with strings, it's used as concatenation. How does the Python interpreter determine whether I'm talking about doing some adding or I'm talking about doing some concatenating? In order for it to be treated as the concatenation operator, both sides have to be a string type. So that means if I want to glue on the string five, well, I can do, I can hard code it and say plus the string five, and that'll get me the hello five. Or I can say hello, concatenate with, now I have a function called str that I can pass the number five to, and that will turn a value into a string. So think of it like you ran out to Home Depot, got this little converter thing, okay, you know, just like you, you, you have various converters that allow you to do USB to something or other. So I got this little container, and I drop a number into it, and it squirts out the string version of that, whatever it is. So there's my hello five. That makes sense? Okay, similarly, if I have the number 123, and I want to add five to it, I really maybe, let's say I want to get 128 out of that. Well, it's going to be ticked off on me right now because it's going to say, hey, 
I don't know how to treat this plus sign. It could be concatenation or it could be addition, but it can't be both. And you've given me a string and an int. What do you want me to do? If I want this guy to be uh, an integer, 123, if the str function could convert a number to a string, you want to take a guess at what function can convert a string to a number? Int. One, two, three. And I'll add to that a five. So this will take the number one, two, three, well, the string representation of one, two, three, and juice that into the number 123. Then I'll add five to that, which will give me a 128. Okay, but don't try to take the int version of something like hello. If you look at it and say, become an integer, and you don't know what the answer should be, don't expect Python to magically know what the answer will be either. Right? So if you're going to use the int function to convert a string to an int, make sure that that string looks like an int and you need it to become one. You can't convert a, a hello or elephant or you know something like that into a number. It doesn't make sense. If you can't give you the answer what it would be in real life, Python's not going to make it into some magical thing for you. All right, make some sense? All right, so you have two power tools that are going to be handy. So string and int are little functions that allow you to turn something that is not a string into a string and something that is a string into an int, provided that it already was an int representation. All right, so that's what they're talking about here. Uh, they're giving you some other um, defining variables, spam is equal to 40, then typing in spam. So this gives you your uh, um, breakdown of the Python uh, language. All right, so now they're going into your first program, and this effectively is your drill assignment. Um, but instead of doing it at the interactive shell, so at the interactive shell, I can come in here and I can say, let me just clear this again. I can call upon the print function. There's a print function, and I can say print out hello world. And that would be the output of the print function. Notice that's different than if I just say hello world like that. The, the uh, font's a little different. This is the output of this function called print. Now, when you go to write this in a full program, I might come up here and I might just say print hello world. You know, a program, you might have a whole bunch of different lines of stuff. And now I saved it inside of a file called test.py. Now you can just come up here and take the lazy route and just say, oh, I'm going to hit the play button and it runs it. There's my hello world there. Or I can go out to my terminal and... Where do I store my, oh, whatever, I'll just type it out here. So I'll say test.py print hello world. So I saved that. And now I can say Python 3 test.py and I can run my hello world program. So what I just did there was type my program, save the file, run the Python interpreter called Python 3, and tell it my program I wanted it to run. That's equivalent to what was happening back here when I typed in my code, I saved it, then I hit the play button. And it runs my program down here. That makes sense? All right, so uh, next homeworks are up. I think for uh, next class, if we look at the calendar, you have drill homework three, four, and project two. These guys are going to require you to uh, uh, so read through some of the, the, the book there. It's going to require you to ask some questions, going to require you to do some modulus, 
Um, so some of the things we showed you today. And then the three Bible homeworks are also due. I'll update the due dates for everything to be before class starts, but uh, make sure you get it in by 6 p.m. Uh, before class starts. If you uh, anticipate having a uh, heavy semester or heavy first eight weeks, you might choose to go ahead, read ahead, since these first couple of assignments are pretty easy and they get drastically more difficult as we move forward. You could always go ahead and try to get a jump start on what comes next just to reduce your workload. Sound good? Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. All right, I will see everybody next Wednesday.